Hello YouTube and welcome to my reading of the Puppet Master's Regime Part 2. Now since this turned out to be such a long pause tub, this will be done in actually three or more parts depending on how much storage space I can free up on my device. And since I do love this pasta, I will be recording this first page in its entirety. So, without further ado, let's begin. <clears throat> when I last bro broached the topic of the 1934 musical, The Puppet Master's Regime, my knowledge was apparently very limited. I had originally believed that all the audience members who entered the theater on that fateful night were deceased, but I was incorrect. One lone audience member, Alice Corley James, was nine years old when her grandparents took her to see the show, lives in Connecticut with her grandchildren. I garnered this information after my long investigation as to the theater which housed the unfortunate events of 1934. I found myself on a wild goose chase after a long line of theater owners shoved me in different directions via emails or the rare private meeting. I was eventually given the home address of a little old man who shall go unnamed. This man had worked in several theaters over the past 50 or so years and had collected many borrowed theater items. One of these items was a box labeled 34 Creeley Wright. The gentleman claimed that he found it in the vaults of the August Wilson Theater, but I'm not sure if he can be trusted, as his eggs seem to be in quite a few baskets, if you understand me. The holly number box contained several sloppy organized papers, all of which detailed the long-awaited production of the Puppet Master's Regime. The most interesting of these files was a bulky folder that detailed the 1928 workshop in London, where the title of the show was originally Mortar's Friends, which was later changed to Mortar's Puppet. As music was refined, however, the title became The Puppet Dressed in Black, and was finally changed to Puppet Master, which is the title they used during the actual staged readings. The folder also contained a partial script for the show. Although many pages appeared to be missing, none of the song lyrics were shown in the script, although the song titles were printed in their place, along with notes for the young actor playing the part of Mortar. Most of the notes are from the director, a man named Richard Weber. One particular note seems a bit ominous. A little less vibrato on this one, Garris. Make me proud. Make us both proud. Mr. Sheridan. This Mr. Sheridan never should have been in any of the other files. He may have been an, uncred an uncredited assistant director, but something about his handwriting does didn't sit right with me. Anyhow, some of the songs are rather fast, some of the song titles are rather fascinating. Tunes with such titles as Never Mind Me, Mister, Mortar Was an Orphan, and Get a Puppet make the production seem like any other. The characters don't seem to be written in any strange way, much to my disappointment. It seems like a harmless little kitty show, cutesy and upbeat. However, as the script progresses, the notes from this Mr. Sheridan become more evident and his message becomes increasingly disturbing. We love the way you used to do it. Stop doing what we never told you to try. Your cheeks puff at the end of this number, Garris. I love it. He loves it. We both love it. They love it. Meet me backstage after the reading, Garris. He has a gift for you. Meet us backstage again, Garris. They love to look at you. Never leave us, Garris. You're too important to the puppet master. After re after reading up to the scene where Mortar and his friends try to sell dolls, clearly titled The Doll Selling Song, I decided to stop reading and do a bit of research on Garris Creeley. I was not prepared for the sickening results. Garris Creeley was born on November 3, 1916. His mother had been a vaudeville stripteaser who lacked the funds necessary to support a child. As a result, he was taken in as a and as a three-year-old boy by a, man who, by a man whose last name was Sheridan. His first name is recorded differently in many documents. Most people believe it to be either Carcamel or Charles. Sheridan was apparently a Coney Island architect who designed elaborate fun houses and carnival freak houses. He was also a private composer, having written many vaudeville numbers and Coney Island themes. Garris Creeley Sheridan was a semi-popular vaudeville performer from 1921 to 1923, upon which he was removed from the Sheridan home after Garris claimed to have been sexually abused by, to have been sexually abused by his adoptive father. Garris was taken to live with Annabelle and Henry McGregor, a middle-class family living in Upper Manhattan. Annabelle and Henry, in an attempt to rid him of his childhood trauma, relocated to Worcester, England, with Henry McGregor's relatives. Coincidentally, the puppet master began her rehearsals 
for the workshop a year after Grace Creeley moved to England. The music and lyrics were still credited with Anonymous. Now, one might assume that this is just another depressing backstory to a childhood per, to a child performer from the early 1900s, but it gets worse. Mr. Unknown Sheridan, along with being an architect and a composer, was also a great patron of childhood pornography. He was the leader of a small group of individuals who specialized in the production of such articles. What makes this more revolting is from that is that from 1921 to 1923, the year that Creeley was his legal son, Sheridan housed a child-centered burlesque theater brothel underneath his estate. In 1924, he was placed in the Danvers Center, Danvers, Danvers State Lunatic Asylum in Massachusetts, and escaped in 1926, a year before rehearsals began for the Puppet Master. Now, returning to the script for the Puppet Master. We actually have a tangible record for both the end of Act 1 as well as most of Act 2. The actual for ending, ending for Act 1, as it was written, was as such. Mortar and his friends designed a puppet exactly like the one that Mortar had seen in his dream. This is explained in a song entitled The Puppet Dressed in Black, which I, was assume, which I assume was cut in the Broadway production. This puppet then comes to life and calls upon his magical powers to send, mortals, to send Mortar and his friends into a parallel universe. Act 2 begins with Mortar and his friend, as well as Mr. Obscure, to be asleep and dangling from puppet strings. The, music, the musical takes more operatic theme, as we have six songs that are played one after another, without a single interview, interval of speech. Song titles being, Never Mind Meester, Me Mr. Reprise, I Can Hear Them Sing, What Is This Place, Mortar Silicoy, Wind Dolls, and The Wind and the Whisperings. After this, Mortar is confronted by the Odd Man in Black from the first act, who in, a long mon who, in a long monologue, explains Mortar's deep, passionate, and sexual longings. Mortar realizes his class dying emotions in a song titled Beautiful Music, in which the man and Mortar apparently fall spontaneously in love. And right before they allude to the thought of intercourse, the puppet dressed in black appears. Jealous of Mortar's affection, Mortar strips naked in front of the puppet, allowing for the wooden demon to seduce him. Mortar offers his soul in return to the puppet in return for the puppet releasing the ones closest to him. When the children and Mr. Obscure re are returned, the puppet dressed in black and the old men reveal their sole motivations to punish little children who repress the nature of their sexual responsibilities. They explain this in what would eventually become the, the show's title song, The Puppet Master's Regime. Then, in spite of in a spell of randomness, the puppet face the puppet's face turns bright red, and he shoves Mortar in a, into a bed shaped like a hand, apparently raping him. In the epilogue, we see that Mortar's friends have all been returned to the puppet shop, but none of them remember anything about him. As you would assume, the workshop didn't do well at all. Anyone with half a brain could understand why a musical well, why children are obligated to have sex with adults, and puppets wouldn't work now, let alone in 1928. It was meant with such a terrible response that, he, that authorities forced the workshop to shut down classifying it as child sex tourism. Garrett Creeley was temporarily removed from the McGregor household for their approval for allowing him to participate in the production, when in reality the cast members were contractually obligated to never speak about the show to anyone outside the production. A week after Garrett returned to McGregor's, he was kidnapped from his bedroom. This all happened a day before his birthday. After two days, the authority found Garris at the theater that had been hiding, that had been holding the workshops. He was found in the basement of the theater, tied to a bed, being violently raped by Sheridan. Sheridan, of course, was being was taken into police custody, where he died two days after a lung infection. However, the most dis disturbing part of the crime scene was described by off Officer James Catwright. We broke through the door and were all tumbling down the stairs. We could hear him. Screaming. We charged into the basement and saw puppets. Puppets everywhere. All of them made to look exactly like the little Creeley fella. Had to be dozens dozens of them all over the room. Some of them were neatly dressed like little dolls. Others didn't have any clothes on at all. It was so disgusting. I feel sick just thinking about it. Along with the recorded 76 Garris Creeley esque puppets that were found underneath the theater, Authorities also found several articles of the occult in Sheridan's makeshift apartment. 
He had apparently been begun to worship an ancient god he called Hodimus, a dark spirit who controlled all of life with, with invisible puppet strings. Most of the investigators, and the investigators believed that Sheridan had created the god himself, using the surplus of insanity he had retained by, his time of, by the time of his death. They also found a 523-page novel that Sheridan had written over the course of the past nine years entitled Puppet. It was, an, it was an extended manuscript version of Puppet Master that was centered around the character of Mortar Absence, a character obviously based on Garrus Creeley. Following the events of Puppet Master, the McGregors admitted Garrus Creeley to the rest, West Riding Mental Hospital, now known as High Royals High Rides Hospital, in order to repair his obvious mental damage. He was supervised by his adoptive uncle, Dr. Gregory McGregor, who personally documented his progression from 1928 to 1932, when he was released. Other than the folder containing, in, containing information for the 1928 workshop, most of the document, document present in Box 34, Creeley Wright, are mass jumbles of different document, documentations, everything from vague police reports to scanning reviews of the workshop and none of them are in, are in any particular order. The only valuable document I've managed to find is a list containing the names of all the audience members who attended the 1934 Broadway premiere. Seeing how Alice Corley James is still alive and was seated in the fourth row of the theater, I hope to contact her soon to continue my investigation. Well, there you go, YouTube. The first page of The Puppet Master's Regime, Act 2. The second page will be recorded in two parts.